So, ahayo, kazumasu, koko ni uru koto wa yoro kobitasu. Oh, and that's, very good. <laughs> very good. that's all the Japanese, unfortunately, you're going to get. Now you're going to get English, and not only that, you're going to get Australian English, unfortunately, for you. So good luck. Um, today, I, I've been asked to present on to, on update on hepatitis C elimination strategies. And essentially, a lot of the work that I've been doing with others at the Burnett and beyond has really been trying to work out how can we achieve those WHO goals. But to start with, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the people that I work with. I don't do this work on my own. And also to say that I receive investigator-initiated grants from um, Gilead Science, ABV and BMS. So hepatitis C, why should we care? Because it's a big killer. It basically affects many people globally and causes an estimated 400,000 deaths annually. So it's a huge problem and it occurs everywhere in the world. Its transmission varies depending on the nature of the country. So in developed countries, um, predominantly driven through people who inject drugs and um, HIV positive gay and bisexual men and others. But in resource limited countries, uh, lower middle income countries, it's um, often to do with um, unsafe blood supply and health systems. It's having enormous global impact and the deaths it causes are greater than those that have been caused, as we got shown yesterday, by malaria, TB and HIV. Gets nowhere near the same funding. But in response to that, the World Health Organisation declared elimination targets for hepatitis C. And the things that we're aiming for is a 65% reduction in deaths from 2015 and an 80% reduction in new infections. And people say, is this possible? And the answer is yes. I was involved in the setting of those targets in the group that when we did the modelling and looked at the models. And it's certainly an achievable task, but it's not going to happen by chance. It's going to happen by using these game-changing curative treatments. But the trick is to make sure they're being used and used fully and properly. And at the moment, that's not happening. So despite the targets and despite these game-changing therapies, the reality is only 12 countries, including Australia and Japan, are on track to achieve those elimination targets. And we have to wonder why we're not tracking well globally. Part of achieving the elimination targets requires, and after yesterday's efforts with these, oh yes, I can do it, um, requires that we treat people. And we have to think about who we treat. We want to stop people from dying, so we need to treat people with significant liver disease so that we reach those targets down there. But the problem is this leaves us with a prevalence that is still way too high. So then we can say, well, let's treat people who are involved in disease transmission, which is people who inject drugs, and we can get the disease prevalence to drop right down to those WHO targets. But the issue is that although we also got deaths to come down, we didn't get deaths to come down far enough. But if you do a combination of two, and in Australia what it shows is we only need to treat every year. You don't have to do it all in one go, around 6,000 people for five years with people with significant liver disease and around 5,000 people a year who inject drugs because that is where transmission occurs in Australia and you will not stop new cases unless you treat the people who are trans ongoing transmission. You'll not turn off the tap of infection. Then you can achieve both. And in Australia, if we do that, we can reach those elimination targets. But many countries globally are not choosing to take what I would call an evidence-based approach to their elimination. They have many, many restrictions on who they choose to treat. An example I'll give is in Europe and the United States, where there are many, and I'll say right now, non-evidence-based restrictions on the use of DAAs. There are rules about not treating somebody who currently injects drugs. There are rules about somebody who is drinking alcohol. There are rules about somebody that have, might have injected drugs in the past but are not. And they say, we won't provide treatment for this. Now, if you think about that, number one, it's not evidence-based. It's not scientific to do so. But number two, it means that what you are doing is not stopping the onward transmission of the virus as treatment as prevention, similar to what we do in HIV. We're part of treating somebody for HIV. We know stops that person from getting sick and dying. But there is the benefit of also when the viral load is right down in HIV, or in the case of hepatitis C, where you have cure, you can't transmit infection if you are cured. So this is a non-evidence-based restriction. 
and many countries continue to hold it, as I said, despite clear clinical evi uh, scientific evidence. And I have done a number of reviews on this now. I did the first reviews when it was happening in the pegylated interferon and ribavirin days, and subsequently after that to show that people who inject drugs, treatment outcomes are just the same, and they don't even need to be on DA therapies like opioid substitution therapies to reduce their drug use, but their treatment outcomes are just as good. What happens, though, is often the medical profession, us, doesn't like treating this group of people. We think they might be unreliable. We think they might not take their medications. We think they might do this. We think they might do that. But the reality is that we are wrong, and the evidence would suggest they do very well, and that it's a bias, a stigma, a prejudice that we carry with us, often related to our background and our training, but it's actually not helpful to our patients and it's not helpful to a public health response of elimination. Similarly, there are many prescriber restrictions in Europe and um, I understand to some extent in Japan where, again, and I'll show you some evidence for it, that specialists have to prescribe as opposed to community prescribing. Now that makes sense or might have made sense in the old pegylated interferon and ribavirin days where these treatments were complicated, required, had many, many side effects, treatment outcomes weren't always so good, and we were often treating complex patients. But we're talking about direct acting antiviral therapies. And it, if you think about it, it's a tablet, one to two tablets daily, minimal side effects for eight to 12 weeks. There is no reason why a general practitioner, or in the case of Australia even, a nurse prescriber, can't provide treatment for this. And I'm going to try to persuade you, and maybe you can have then a discussion about this in Japan, as to why this is the case and why this is important. And why is it important is because the reality is it's nothing personal against us, but our patients don't like going to big tertiary hospitals. They don't particularly like it, and it's not easy for them necessarily to do it. And whilst you might get the first 30 to 50% of people will come to the hospital and you'll do well, what it'll be harder is for the last 50% of the people you're trying to treat and cure to come to your hospital because their life is more complicated than that. They have families to be looking after, children to look after, parents to look after, jobs to be going to. And we have to think, how do we provide the service where they would want it. And here's the evidence to suggest that this is very possible and perhaps the better way to do it. So, we need universal access, but we also need to understand that there is real access and people are not lost to the cascade. And Australia is a really good example of this, but this is happening everywhere globally. When the DAAs first come onto the market, there is a large amount of treatment happens, treatment uptake. But as you see, it very quickly drops off. And this is, pattern is similar everywhere I look in the world. Big uptake with warehousing and then the fall down with the waterfall of the people that can make it come in and others don't. And we lose people from the cascade of care. So we really have to think about this cascade of care and the multi-pronged approach. And what we have to understand is if we're going to eliminate where there is ongoing transmission, then we need to increase testing. Testing is key. And often what we're doing is nowhere near enough testing to actually replicate, to say, well, this is the number of people needing treatment. And again, this is a global problem. So we need to increase testing with innovative approaches, point of care tests for the antibody, and where appropriate point of care tests for the RNA tests with the Cepheid Gene Expert machine that you'll see just there. So we really need to do this because what we are seeing is a drop off. But rapid tests alone aren't just that. They work really well, but work that we've done shows you still lose people from the cascade of care. And sometimes it's because somebody doesn't have time to wait around for an hour or so to get that test result. If you think about yourself, if you have a busy day and you go to see the doctor, you already wait half an hour to an hour before the doctor lets you in. The doctor does a test and say, oh, can I do another test? Will you wait around for one to two hours for me? Well, I give you that test result and say, no, I'm busy. I've got to go back to work. I've got a clinic. So we have to have set up so that the nurse or the doctor can follow you up to book you in. So really, point of care tests are really valuable, but they're not the only thing. We have to have good systems. And then when we think about where do we provide treatment, and what I'll simply say is no one best model of care works. In Australia, I have nurses providing treatment for people who inject drugs 
working out of a van where they do fibre scans, taking the bloods. You can do telehealth. You can have community-based clinics. And these can be very successful. The TAP study is a study that we've been conducting, which is treating, as I said, people, people who inject drugs in the community who don't want to come up to my big tertiary hospital. I work at a tertiary hospital and still see patients. But they don't want to come and see me there. They would prefer to see the nurse in the community where they are. And this has been very successful and feasible in treating people who inject drugs. John Dillon in Scotland has been doing some really innovative studies and one of them is saying, well, why don't we provide treatment in pharmacies for people if they're going in for their opiate substitution therapy and shown this to be successful and we're just starting a study with John looking at pharmacy-based care and a randomised control <coughs> trial called um, ReachSeq. Project ECHO by Sanjay Aurora in the United States in New Mexico found that people would much prefer, rather than having to travel two to three hours into the centre, in, at his hospital in, um, in Albuquerque, he much preferred to do telehealth with their GP and was a very, very successful telehealth arrangement. The PRIME study, which we have published since in CID this year, clearly was a randomised control trial assessing optimal treatment of care. And what we did is we had people at a community clinic and then we randomised them to have all of their testing care at the community clinic or go up to the big tertiary hospital. And what they did is that they, once they were randomised, they had to have their fibre scan either at the community clinic or in the tertiary hospital. And the key things that we found from the PRIME study was, and I think this is really important, that number one, people who were assessed at the community clinic were more likely to start treatment, and people who started treatment at the community clinic were more likely to get an SVR12 than the people we sent up to the tertiary hospital. And two things happened, is they didn't make it up to the big tertiary hospital. So we had a much greater dropout. So whilst we might have a great success in treating the person in front of us when we're at our tertiary hospitals, what happens, or at our specialist clinics, is what we're not doing is treating the person who is not sitting in front of us. And so what the PRIME study clearly showed is that treatment uptake was better and treatment outcomes were better if you treated somebody in a community-based setting. It was their preference. You were pro providing a patient-preferred... As much as it's a horrible thing, we tend to want to incarcerate people globally, often people who inject drugs, often people with mental health is issues, but it's a wonderful place to treat people. In Australia and elsewhere, it's been shown to be a really... If somebody is to be incarcerated, then we should be looking at systems to provide treatment in these settings, because the people we incarcerate are often the people who have ongoing transmission. So in summary, if hepatitis C elimination is to be achieved, we need universal access to DAAs. But no one model of care provides the best evidence. Just do what works for your country, your system, but don't think that everybody wants to come and see you at your tertiary hospital. So important that countries have also political and strategic leadership, because what we have is a lack of funds for this. And different countries have had different responses. Georgia has developed a national plan, so we need to have leadership if we're going to go for elimination targets. So Georgia doing a great job, a national plan. South Africa developed a clear investment case for why elimination could be achieved. Scotland decided data, 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 very accurate data to persuade their politicians to go ahead and do this. Egypt has had a massive testing and linkage to care program supported by their president. And they are basically trying to test 60 million people have nearly succeeded in a year and to treat all of those. Australia, we've had a multi-pronged approach to elimination and we are having some success, but engagement with the community because our affected populations, people who inject drugs, gained by sexual men, we need to engage with them. And so far we've treated about 80,000 people. This slide's a little out of date. We're showing, because we have a surveillance system to monitor it, that we're reducing incident infection but we know we are not getting enough people being tested. And we're about to run into this problem of this falling treatment numbers. And I think most countries are finding this problem. I suspect Japan won't be alone in having difficulty in treating that last 30 to 50% of people. So we need to ensure we keep people on the cascade. We are, as I was looking, you know, as we were seeing slides yesterday and, and presentations, having a reduction in morbidity and mortality related to hepatitis C. So we are having success early but we need to maintain that success. And our models tell us in Australia, and when I look at models from around the world, that we will fail in this effort if we don't increase engagement in community and community testing. So we really need to think about how to scale up testing and linkage to care. 
The final slide I want to talk to you about, which is, I think, not no, so much an issue for Japan or Australia, but essentially for us to support many of our neighbours in the elimination efforts, is to say that elimination costs money, but it saves money. And people will save, countries will save significant amount of dollars if we have a clear elimination strategy. And that savings can begin by about 2030. So that's really important. And if you look at the indirect economic benefits, not only do you begin to save money, but countries begin to make money from the indirect benefits of people being well at work, not needing to be at home and looking after their family, their parents and their like. So, to me, we have many challenges ahead. I think elimination is possible, but there are many, many challenges ahead. But one of them is us and the stigma and discrimination that we others often bring to the sector. And we need to address this, our attitude to drugs, our attitude to people who are at risk, our attitude to key populations, and work really hard to have evidence-based approaches to our elimination efforts. I'd like to acknowledge everybody who helped with this work and people with the WISH World Economic Summit for Health. Thank you very much.